start. Uh, welcome everyone to this edition of a Verifiability Talk. It's my honor to introduce Fritz van Dracher, uh, from Radboud University in Nijmegen. Uh, Fritz has worked in many different areas, starting from uh, process algebra and operational semantics, all the way to these days when he's, where he's working on uh, automata learning. And he will be talking about uh, that topic today. Um, you may know Dana Anglin's celebrated L-Star, uh, which has been around for many years. And today, um, Fritz will present something that is fresh from the oven, uh, a major improvement over the state of the art in automotive learning. So Fritz, thank you very much for having accepted our, um, our invitation. Uh, the, floor, the floor is yours. Before I um, give the floor to you, I just want to announce that this talk is being recorded and it will be posted on YouTube. So if you don't want to show up in the recording, please uh, log in as a guest maybe with a different name even if you want, <laughs> and don't turn on, on your camera and it should be fine. Thank you again, Fritz, and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it's a pleasure to uh, give this presentation. I'm very uh, uh, passionate and, and excited about this, uh, this work. Um, I think it's too, too early to say that it's really better than or, or faster than, than the, the uh, approach of, of Anglin, but it's, it's sort of, different and, and interesting and the uh, experimental results are, are, are promising and I think there are several sort of interesting angles for for future work. So um, yeah this is joint work with Borat Garval and Julian Rott and Torsten Wiesman and we will present it at uh, TACAS uh, at TACAS this year. Uh, but uh, yeah, first I, I talk about it here and I also have more time to, to go in some detail and, and give a bit of an intro. Uh, if you have questions on the way, please uh, feel free to, to, to interrupt me. Uh, I'm happy to take, take questions. So my plan is to um, first start with sort of a bit of a general introduction to this area of model learning or active automata learning then move to applications to discuss what has been done and, and uh, also what's still needed and, and what motivated our work on uh, on L sharp and then I try to explain the L sharp algorithm spent most of the time actually on on, on, on doing that and conclude uh, with some conclusions and future work okay so we are interested in black box uh, active learning it means that we have this system under test, SUT, and it's behaving according to some state machine, and we want to figure out what this state machine is. So we send inputs, we observe outputs, and we may, uh, we assume that we can reset the system and bring it back to its initial state, that we have sort of a reset button. We also assume the system is deterministic. So if we apply the same sequence of inputs twice, we will observe the same sequence of outputs. So actually we will assume that uh, the system under tests has a behavior that can be modeled as a deterministic Mealy machine. And so in practice, I, all the assumptions which I'm making here are often, often relaxed. Uh, so often we uh, are interested in non-deterministic systems. We are interested in systems where the behavior is not like a mealy machine, that maybe inputs and outputs do not strictly alternate, maybe they cannot be reset. Uh, but for this talk, we are going to work in the simple setting of, of mealy machines and uh, discuss this approach of L sharp. And, and yeah, then we are pretty sure this, this approach can be extended to a richer category of, of, of models. And so in a mealy machine, deterministic mealy machine, we have a finite set of states. There is an initial state. Um, we fix a set of inputs and a set of outputs, and then every transition is labeled with uh, an input and a resulting output. And a transition goes from one state to the other, and we assume the system is deterministic. So for every state and every input, uh, there is a unique outgoing transition and a unique resulting output. And the system is, is complete. So, so the transition function is always uh, defined. So this sort of um, a very simple model uh, makes it easier to present our algorithm. 
but uh, actually this is useful in many uh, applications uh, so you can describe even coffee machines um, well maybe even more all kinds of um, communication network protocols and, and, and industrial controllers uh, but for the sake of, of the example uh, here you see a three state mealy machine describing a simple coffee machine uh, and I won't I go through it in detail but the, the behaviors of this machine can be obtained by applying a sequence of, of inputs and then observing the resulting sequence of outputs. So for instance, if in the initial state, which is marked with the arrow up here, and the initial state zero, we enter 10 cents, we move to state 10, and then when we press button, we observe coffee. Uh, and then uh, we are back into the initial state, so we can add five cents, press a button, and then and we don't get coffee, but if we add five more cents and press a button, we do get coffee. So the behaviors are uh, that for a given set of inputs, we observe a corresponding sequence of, of outputs. And two mealy machines are deemed equivalent if for every sequence of inputs, they return the same sequence of, of outputs. And um, yeah, so our goal is to learn a hidden mealy machine um, yeah, which is sort of in this black box by observing a sequence of uh, a finite number of its behaviors yeah, we print present a sequence of inputs and we observe the resulting sequence of outputs so this is a form of machine learning because we do a finite number of observations and and from that we want to infer a general function we want to uh, obtain a mealy machine, which basically gives us for every sequence of inputs a corresponding sequence of outputs. So this is a famous and classical problem in automata theory. And already in 1956, Edward Moore had this famous paper where he addressed this problem. Then there is the celebrated thesis of uh, E. Mark Gold, where he proved that um, uh, this 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 problem is uh, if you're given a finite set of observations to, to it's it's np hard to come up with a minimal uh, automaton describing those those observations and then in 87 dana engrin came up with a setting uh which we will be building on um where um you do active learning and where uh, so a learner can pose both membership queries and equivalence queries. I will explain those in a bit more detail. And, and that, that was a, a breakthrough which also enabled many applications. Uh, so in the setting of Dana Engwin, you have this teacher which sort of knows the hidden mealy machine. There's a learner. So the, the learner sends sequences of inputs to the teacher and gets uh, the corresponding outputs. Uh, and and in, after a couple of observations, the, the learner uh, may construct an hypothesis, a sort of mealy machine, which he believes describes the, the, the behavior. And then the learner may send this hypothesis, a uh, mealy machine to the teacher. And the teacher will either uh, uh, reply that the hypothesis is correct, that is, it is equivalent to the, the mealy machine of the teacher, or it is not correct yet. And in that case, there is a counterexample, which is a sequence of inputs for which the hypothesis and the hidden mealy machine have different, uh, different outputs. And so this was the setup of proposed by Dana Engwin. And she also came up with an algorithm which using a polynomial algorithm, number of queries can sort of do the job. And uh, so the learner can construct this, this, this automaton. So, okay, I want, I, I think I basically explained the learning game, so I won't repeat that. Um, but there has been an enormous amount of work um, following Dana Engwin's paper in which various improvements of our learning algorithm have been uh, improved and I listed some of these algorithms here. Um, the PhD thesis of Malte Eastberner uh, gives an excellent survey of all these algorithms and I took this table largely from 
uh, from this, this thesis. And so um, what you see here is sort of the, the, the number of queries uh, or the number of input symbols needed, worst case, by uh, these algorithms. And so the number of queries can be expressed in terms of uh, the number of states n of the, the hidden media machine, the number of inputs that may be uh, applied to this media machine, and then the length of the maximal counterexample. Uh, because sort of you may have um, uh, helpful teachers like Dana Engwin who give you uh, sort of short and instructive counterexamples if your hypothesis is wrong, but you can also think of demonic teachers who give you counterexamples of which are millions of symbols long, and then it's really hard to make sense of them. And these type of counterexamples may occur in practice, for instance, if you I suppose you are learning a model of some industrial controller, um, then hey, you, if you have an hypothesis, you sort of may run this hypothesis in parallel to the real system, and maybe then after doing this for a few years, suddenly you, you notice a discrepancy. And then the accumulated log, uh, which shows these differences, is really long. And so the original uh, algorithm of Dana Engwin, uh, there the complexity depends linearly on um, and the length of the, the longest possible counterexample. And that is not so good. Uh, and, and, and so there is, there was a major improvement, major insight by uh, Ravist and Shapir, who have a complexity, which is also still uh, quite high, but where uh, the, 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 the lengths of the uh, longest counter example only appears logarithmically. And this, um, uh, this, this basic algorithm of Ravest Shapir uh, has been improved, but the, the worst case complexity is, is still the same. And actually the worst case complexity of the algorithm I will present today also is, is the same as the one for Ravest and Shapir. Um, and then in practice, often uh, you, um, it's not so much the number of queries that you use, but it is sort of the total number of input symbols that you provide. Uh, so um, uh, you could have just a, a, a few queries, maybe just a single query to learn a model, but if this query is really long, then of course uh, the time you need to, 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 to do this is, will, be, will be long. So the symbol complexity sort of is maybe a better measure. OK, so by now several tools have been uh, developed which implement um, Angular's algorithms and various improvements, and you can implement them uh, for various types of automata, so also for deterministic finite automata, or more machines, for instance, or non-deterministic automata. Um, and uh, so people also, besides sort of the active learning algorithms like proposed by Dana Engwin, these tools often also support passive learning algorithms where you are given a set of behaviors and then you want to have a corresponding automaton. So I mentioned here one tool, LearnLib, which is the one we compare to um, in, in our experiments, but there are several other um, tools on, uh, available which also provide good implementations. OK, so a major insight uh, which allowed us to apply this, this um, algorithm of Dana Engwin on um, real software was in a paper by Pele Vardy and Yanakakis, where they observed that sort of if the learner produces an equivalence query, then uh, you may use an existing conformance testing algorithm um, to, to check whether the system under test or the system under learning sort of behaves equivalently to the hypothesis. And uh, Yanakakis is, is famous for his work on, on conformance testing algorithms, so for him this was a pretty natural idea. And then of course, what we end up with is that the uh, the teacher is no longer perfect because it may occur that a teacher sort of has been testing for two days whether uh, uh, an implementation conforms to a specification model and didn't find any um, counterexample and then 
yeah, what do you do? So it, at some point the teacher may say, OK, let's stop. Uh, and, and, and answer yes, even though uh, the model still is not correct. Um, but in practice, this, this, this setup works pretty well. And, and so we see a clear responsibility here that the, the responsibility for the teacher is to construct an, an, an hypothesis and the uh, responsibility of the teacher is to debunk it. And um, uh, yeah, so this, uh, this setting works uh, work quite well in, in practice. So uh, there are numerous applications by now. And, and uh, so I think automata learning is in particular quite effective to find um, bugs in, in, in protocol implementations. Uh, so because what you can do is to learn a model of a protocol implementation and then compare it to the, the uh, RFC and uh, that was the officially uh, desired behavior and then you can find some issues. And so here is a model of uh, I think a Windows server of TCP and you see one non-conformance here. But we looked at uh, TLS and found serious issues. Uh, my student Paul Viterau, uh, together with Falk Hauer, they found a, a real issue in the Linux implementation of TCP, which uh, has been fixed. Uh, we looked at SSH and actually we, we looked at many protocols and, and we found many issues and other teams also found uh, many issues. So this stuff is useful. We also look at applications uh, for industrial to an area of industrial control. And so we try to, to learn models of, of controllers, for instance. And we looked at a printer controller, and then you get a model like this, which is we, we, the visualization has been generated using Jeffy. And uh, this is an, an, a melee machine with 3,000 states, so all the details uh, are hard to see maybe, but, but it's a nice uh, a nice picture. So we can, can learn these type of models. And that can be useful um, because when you have learned a model, then for instance, one thing you can do is that if the implementation changes, um, it's maybe even completely replaced by, by a refactored implementation, you can check whether this refactored implementation still behaves according to uh, the, the old behavior of the legacy component that you have learned. And if not, you can raise an alarm or uh, you can even go further. You can use the learned model as an armor which blocks any action from the refactored implementation which you do not like. And ideally, uh, but this is utopia, um, uh, when you learned a model of a legacy component, you could use it to generate new code. Uh, but I'm not sure whether that is a good idea, but but uh, so this 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 use uh, as an observer and armor is is potentially very interesting. And we also did a case study with Philips, where uh, for both a, a legacy component and a refactored implementation, we learned a model, um, and then we compared those models using an equivalence checker. And initially, then uh, sometimes it occurs that the models are are not equivalent. Uh, but then what you can do is you, you replay the counterexample on the real implementation and then you discover a counterexample for your hypothesis model. Uh, but after a few times, um, uh, the, the counterexamples can be replayed either on the legacy implementation or the refactored implementation. And then, uh, yeah, that's useful information. You, you have spotted the real difference. So uh, together with uh, ASML, we did some uh, big experiments. Uh, ASML build, builds these uh, wafer scanners, this is lithographic equipment, which is crucial right now. And, and they're earning billions of dollars right now because the world economy needs lots of these machines because there's a shortage of, shortage of chips. Um, so they were interested whether uh, model learning can, could be applied in, in their setting. And, and so they have some components which are real legacy, but other components which have been developed using model based software development techniques. So for those models, they do for those components, they, they do have models. And the question was, OK, can we learn those models? And uh, so that has been posed as a challenge to the academic community. And um, here's a very interesting diagram where you see sort of a few hundred components which ASML 
uh, wanted us to consider, for which they, 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 they do have the models. And then uh, the green, every uh, plus sign is a model. And um, so they're displayed in, 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 in this um, grid where on the X axis you see the number of inputs and on the Y axis the number of states of the corresponding media machine. And then uh, you see that some models can be learned and, and some still we cannot learn. Uh, actually, meanwhile, I think a lot of red pluses have become green because we have more powerful learning technology, but there, there is still a challenge here. So this is this is really interesting and exciting. And, and uh, uh, so we, we want to improve uh, our algorithms to, to be able to, to learn all these models. So what do we need? We need um, algorithms that basically need fewer input symbols to learn a model uh, because yeah, then, then it will be faster. And another thing is that we somehow need a better integration of learning and testing because for larger models, actually the, the learning time is completely dominated by the equivalence oracle. And so the Looks, the, the, the problems in those hypotheses, you need trick, very tricky sequences of, of inputs and t existing testing algorithms have difficulties to, to find those. Um, so there is a lot to be gained there. And then, yeah, to deal with real legacy components, we also need to be able to handle data and timing and so on. Um, well, today I'm going to discuss an algorithm which helps us with question one and maybe gives us a clue for how to tackle question two. Um, and uh, so for me as a Dutch person, it's nice that uh, sort of the algorithm is sort of inspired by two heroes, two of my heroes from, from Dutch uh, uh, universities. On the left, you see Brouwer, the uh, mathematician who's one of the founders of topology and, and intuitionistic mathematics. And on the right is, is Dijkstra. Um, so Somehow our algorithm is, is inspired by, by ideas from these two people. OK, so how. Um, so let me now just start and explain. Uh, the, the algorithm to you and. Uh, uh, actually, it's it's pretty simple and, and so I, I go through most of the details and, and uh, I hope you, you you get it and if you have questions, please interrupt. So. Um, uh, first idea we have is that we are not going to use this observation table, which is used in um, uh, the Anguin style algorithms. No, we are going to store all the uh, observations in an observation tree, and that is going to be our primary data structure. So here on the right, you see a simple three state Mealy machine, and on the left, you see an observation tree. Um, for this, this media machine and what we do is we uh, store the observations in sort of a tree like uh, structure. Now this is an observation tree for the automaton on the right um, because sort of basically we can have a, a function, a sort of simulation which maps every state from the tree to a state of the automaton that's indicated by colors here. And um, uh, so every transition in the observation tree actually directly corresponds to a transition in the in the automaton. And so for instance, the transition from T3 to T4 in the observation tree, um, uh, there, there we see that T3 corresponds to Q2, it's the green state, and T4 corresponds to Q1, the blue state, and uh, uh, there is an a C transition in the observation tree, which actually corresponds to the A C transition in the uh, in, in, in the media machine. And so we have this sort of functional simulation from the observation tree to the media machine. However, our le the learner can see the observation tree, but doesn't see the colors, and and and, and doesn't know the simulation. Right, it's hidden. Um, so yeah, what, what can the learner do when he or she just has this, this observation tree? So there, a partner's 
uh, comes in. Sorry, Fritz, may I ask uh, a question? Yeah. So in the tree, what is the yeah. semantics of going to the right and going to the left? Is there a difference? Sorry, what, what is your question? Is there a semantics uh, attached to going to the to the right and to the left in the tree? Uh, no, no, no. OK, OK. No, it, it, and so it's a tree, so either we have a root and, and for every node has a unique path to the root. So in that sense, it's it's a tree. It's it's um, uh, basic. This this observation tree also is a media machine. Only it's partial, right? Because for some nodes there are no uh, successors. Um, and yeah, that's it. It's a tree in graph theoretic sense, and and uh, and we have inputs and outputs labeling the the, the transitions. Uh, but it, we call it an observation tree for a given media machine if there exists such a functional simulation. Right. Thank you, that's clear. Yep, OK. Um, yeah, so um, in, in Nijmegen, there is sort of this tradition of people doing intuitionistic mathematics, and these are somewhat strange people, and, and they, uh, they, they don't want to use certain laws which the rest of mathematicians do use. Um, but it's nevertheless very, very interesting. And, and so in constructive mathematics, um, people often talk about partners relations, and that is a sort of constructive form of inequality. And so um, two real numbers are, uh, are apart. When, when they are different, and in fact, you can construct a rational number between them. So they are not just not equal, but they are uh, very much unequal. So therefore, uh, you have the usual inequality sign, but then with an extra vertical bar, and, and this, in this way, you obtain the hash uh, symbol. Um, and so Brouwer argued that apartness, and this constructive form of Inequality is more fundamental, more basic than equality. He defined equality in terms of of apartness. Um, so, yeah, that head was called uh, Örtlich Verschieden or Entfernung uh, because Brouwer wrote in, in, in German and Brouwer's student uh, gave an axiomatization. Um, and so it's just sort of negated equality, right? So it's it's irreflexive. You are not apart from yourself. It's symmetric if X is apart from Y, then Y is apart from X. And then there is this law if X is apart from Y, uh, then for any number Z, uh, X will be apart from Z or Y will be apart from Z. Um, so this was intuitionistic mathematics. And um, um, recently, uh, my colleagues Herman Geuvers and, and Bart Jacobs studied partners in the context of label transition systems and bias simulations and that was sort of the trigger to for us to use it so now some people who listen to this talk because i gave it before say well okay what's the big deal because yeah so sort of rather focusing on on equality you focus on inequality um uh yeah that's it and and uh, but but we will see that it, it does make a difference and so Basically, if you think of it, the L star algorithm focuses on equivalence of states or equality of states by refining the near road equivalence. And what we will do is we will focus on inequivalence of states by focusing on apartness. And, and so states are inequivalent if we have a constructive proof that they behave differently. So we have we focus on inequality and we focus on actually constructing it. Um, uh, so that, that sort of change of perspective gives us a, a, a different algorithm, as I will explain. And so let's go back to our example. Uh, so we have this observation tree as the learner sees it. The learner doesn't know about the, the refinement, uh, but still the learner can do something it, the learner can sort of figure out that certain states in the observation tree cannot possibly correspond to uh, the same state in the media machine. 
Um, and so we say that two states are apart if they both enable the same input sequence sigma for which the outputs are different. So in this example, for instance, states T0 and T3 are apart because in T0, when you have an input A, you get an output A, whereas in T3, an input A um, will lead to uh, outputs, output C. And so from a testing perspective, we have a sep separating sequence a and and so okay so a we call it a witness for uh, the apartness of t3 and t0 similarly uh, t3 and t2 are apart uh, same witness uh, because in t2 an input a will lead to an output a and in t3 an input a will lead to an output c so they they cannot possibly correspond to the same state in the media machine that we're trying to learn and then finally uh, T0 and T2 are apart because uh, BA is a separating sequence. Uh, so BA leads to uh, BA in do it in, in T0 and it leads to BC if we do it in, in T2. So these three states T0, T2 and T3 are pairwise apart. Um, and so this is notion of apartness and and people may argue well why don't you call it a separating sequence and we could could do that but but uh, we 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 follow the philosophy of of brouwer here and uh, you'll see where it leads us okay so uh, what what do we know well whenever two states are apart in the observation tree we know that in the hidden media machine uh, according to this functional simulation which we know exists they they will not be equivalent and moreover, um, our relation will satisfy a couple of simple properties. It's irreflexive, it's symmetric, and it's weakly co-transitive. So we, we don't have exactly the same properties as, as Brouwer uh, and, and Heiting had, but a weak form. Namely, so if we have a witness which shows that R and R prime are different, uh, so we have a separating sequence for R and R prime, and Q is a state in the observation tree that enables this same sequence, then uh, R will be apart from Q or R prime will be apart from Q. But for instance, if Q is a leaf state in our observation tree, we have no information about it, then we cannot conclude that it is apart from R or R prime. And so therefore we have this weak, weak form of um, co-transitivity. OK, so now the learning algorithm sort of slowly appears. What we do is we, we use the basic uh, setup of Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, we could actually copy verbatim uh, a paragraph from Dijkstra's paper where he says, OK, we um, subdivide the states in, in um, <clears throat> our graph into three sets. And there is a basis, uh, and the basis forms a subtree from in, 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 in the graph, uh, in our observation tree in, in our case. And well, we assume that these states are pairwise apart. Then there is a frontier. So those are the immediate successor states of, of basis states, which are not in the basis themselves. And then we have the remaining states. So um, if we look at, at our uh, basic example again, uh, we established that, that there are these three states which are pairwise apart. So we can put them in the basis. And then there are some yellow states, which are immediate successors of basis states, which are not in the basis themselves. And so this is the picture we, we get. And now we have to make progress, right? We, 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 we have to come up with, with queries and, and, and to increase our knowledge. So um, ideally, uh, what we would like to achieve is that, for instance, T1 is apart from all three basis states. Uh, in that case, we say that um, T1 is isolated, uh, and that's nice because then we can extend the, uh, the basis. We have a fourth state that we can add. If we cannot isolate T1, then at least what we can do is to identify it and that means that it is apart from all states in the basis except one. 
uh, because if, if, if we, for instance, um, uh, have established that, that will help us to construct an hypothesis. Right? Because the hypothesis will be an automaton where the states are just the states in the, in the basis. Um, and then uh, we need to know for every input what is the corresponding output uh, when you apply it into a certain basis state and also where the transition will lead us to. Now, if, T, if we manage to prove that T1 is, say, apart from both T2 and T3, we know that in our hypothesis, the outgoing A transition from T0 will have to be a self-loop. And so our target will be to identify or isolate the frontier states. So, but how can we do it? Well, that's easy yeah, because um, we may use this co-transitivity. And so for every pair of basis states, we have a separating sequence. We have a witness which shows that they are apart. So what we can do, uh, for instance, uh, the, the um, say the input sequence A uh, is a witness that shows that T0 and T3 are apart. So if we run that sequence from frontier state T1, then after doing that, we gain information. And so that is the game we are playing. Uh, and so now I'm going to identify all the frontier states by running the separating sequences which exist for the basis states. And, um, and so if I do a an, uh, an separating sequence A and, and observe output A, then I know that T1 is apart from T3. Um, and then when I run this other separating sequence BA, uh, which separates T0 from T2, then I look at the observed output and I conclude that T1 is apart from T3. And, and so this is, I, I continue playing this game. Uh, so whenever um, for a basis state, uh, a, a certain input has not been defined, I just do an experiment to add it and then I know the, the, the output uh, for the transition from this, this uh, hypothesis state. And then I identify um, the, uh, the frontier state by doing uh, the, 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 the separating sequences which, which I have for the basis. So this gives a clear sequence of uh, experiments. And then after that, I can construct an hypothesis uh, when this when this terminates. Because so how do I construct an hypothesis? Well, uh, so I take just a, uh, a mealy machine where the states are exactly the same states as we have in the basis. And um, uh, so if there is a transition between two basis states, then I just copy that in the hypothesis. And then if there is a um, uh, transition from a frontier state and I have identified this frontier state and there's basically just one state it can go to and I close the loop and, and then I get my hypothesis. And so this gives us the basic idea for L sharp. Uh, because uh, so what, what is the algorithm? Well, we um, uh, repeatedly apply um, one of, of four rules and these rules can be compl applied completely in a non-deterministic order. So actually we use Dijkstra's guarded command notation uh, to, to describe our algorithm uh, because it's, it's non-deterministic, right? In, there, in, in, in a certain point, several rules may apply. But so what are these rules? Well, the first rule say, okay, if you have isolated a frontier state, so it's apart from all the basis states, then hip hip array, you may extend the basis. Um, and then the second rule says, okay, if there is a basis state for which there is no outgoing transition for some input, well, then we just do it. And so we go to the state um, and we look at the access sequence to, which brings us to the state, extend it with a symbol the input symbol i and then do an output query and then the teacher will respond with uh, the resulting outputs and we 
record those in the observation tree. And, and then we have a new frontier state. And then rule three says, OK, if we have, suppose we have a frontier state which is not yet isolated or identified. So that means that it is not apart from two basis states, say R and, and R prime. Then we look at a separating sequence for R and R prime. Uh, so that's a witness for, for the apartness of R and R prime. And we, we run that as an output query. So we go to state Q and then we have the separating sequence. And after doing that, and by weak co-transitivity, um, our state, our frontier state uh, Q will either be apart from R or from R prime. So if we continue doing that, uh, then in a while uh, every frontier state will either be identified or isolated and, and we can continue. Uh, because either we extend the basis uh, or we have uh, obtained a situation where the, the frontier there are no isolated state and, and the basis is complete and then we can build an hypothesis and send that to the teacher. Um, and the teacher uh, I will reply with a counter example. Actually, we can be a bit smarter because sometimes uh, when you have a really big observation tree, um, maybe somewhere deep down in the tree, there is still a counter example learning for your hypothesis. And, and so we do a check whether the hypothesis is consistent with, with the uh, observation tree. But if not, we, we, we get a counter example and then somehow we need to process it. So let me explain how, how we do it because but and basically what the result is of, of processing a counter example is that our original hypothesis is no longer an hypothesis. We gained extra information. So how, how does it work? Well, suppose uh, we have a counter example. So what does it mean? Um, uh, the the uh, teacher has given us a long run, which is included in our observation tree. And uh, if we do the same sequence of inputs from this run in our hypothesis, at some point there is a difference. And so at some point the outputs will be different. But that means that um, there are two, uh, this just before the difference in, in the output, there are two states, one in the observation tree and the other in the hypothesis, where uh, the outputs are, are different, so they are apart. Um, so and we will have such a conflict, uh, two states which are apart. Now we know that this conflict must occur at a frontier or later. Why is that? Well, the hypothesis is directly constructed from the observation tree. And so up to the frontier, it's exactly the same as, as the observation tree. So we cannot have any difference in, in, in behavior. So it, the, the differences will only show up afterwards. So what do we do? Um, we, uh, if, if the conflict occurs at the frontier, we are done uh, because we, we uh, our original hypothesis is no longer an hypothesis. We, we gained uh, some new information. Probably uh, we have managed to isolate a frontier state and, and we can extend the basis. Um, and otherwise we apply the trick of um, uh, Henry Fest and Shapir who do sort of a binary search. Two states halfway, um, R, say R prime and Q prime. Uh, had they, um, uh, and we, we look at this sequence of input sigma and, and the counter example ETHA, uh, which uh, shows that R and Q are, are apart. And then we run, um, the sigma two eta in the hypothesis. So we first go to Q prime, and then we do uh, the second part of, of, of the counter example. So now there are two cases. The first case is that we get from Q prime. 
And then we're happy because we are free. Yeah. Didn't hear you for about uh, 10 seconds, 20 seconds. There, I think there, there might be a problem in your connection, but you maybe you can repeat just the, the last few sentences. OK. Um, so we heard the, yeah, the bit so, about Ben Shapar uh, kind of cutting the counter example, but the last bit regarding that red line, we couldn't hear properly. OK, yeah, so I cut the counter example and then I, I do an extra output query. So I uh, go to state Q prime, which is a state in, in, in the basis, right? And from there, I do input sequence sigma 2 eta. And now there are two cases. Because if the outputs which I observe are um, different from the outputs which I observed from R prime, then I know that R prime and Q prime are apart. And I, so I move the conflict closer to the frontier. Uh, so that's one case. But if um, they are uh, the same, then what I can do is I can consider the run um, in the hypothesis from Q prime with input sigma two and, and eta. And uh, that will be the, give the same outputs as uh, in, in, in the, the long green run. Uh, and then I have established that um, uh, had this axis, uh, I, I will have established that there is, is, is a conflict uh, here uh, halfway. So basically it is sort of a simple case distinction which allows me to reduce the distance to the frontier by a factor two by just a single output query. And, and so yeah, yeah, here's the pseudocode, but, but that basically um, and gives us the, the, the algorithm. And so let's do one example. And so let's suppose we want to learn this coffee machine from one of the initial slides. And so in L sharp, we always start with a basis which has a single state, right? And, and then we um, look at, uh, we, do, we have then all the frontier states. Uh, and, and now all the frontier states are identified because trivially uh, they are apart from um, all the uh, basis states except one. Yeah, there's just one basis state, so uh, that's trivially met. So that means we always get a trivial first hypothesis in L sharp uh, where we just have a self loop for, for these states. Now the teacher will give us a counter example and say, well, your hypothesis is wrong because uh, if you enter 10 cents and press the button, you get a coffee, which is not in accordance with your hypothesis. So then we analyze this counter example and we see that the conflict occurs right away at the frontier uh, because at the frontier uh, we get uh, a coffee and, and that's not the case in the hypothesis. So because there is a conflict there, uh, we can extend the basis, um, and so now uh, this, this three states becomes part of the basis. So then what we need to do in L sharp is to um, uh, add the new frontier states uh, because we've extended the basis, and we need to identify the frontier states. Uh, do they correspond to state one or to state three? So we uh, do so by running the separating sequence, which is B in all the frontier states. Um, and then we see that some of the frontier states should have a behavior similar to, to one and, and others have a behavior similar to three. So that gives us our second hypothesis. And now uh, we ask again the teacher for a counterexample. Now suppose it's a bit longer. Uh, I will go a bit quick and, and don't go through all the, the details, but the slides uh, will be made available and, and, and you can sort of look at it. And, and so now what we need to do is to, to do this binary search thing and, and, and sort of apply a shorter counter example. And, and when we do that, we, we identify the third state of, of our coffee machine. And uh, so then we need to extend the frontier again. We need to identify all the uh, frontier states. And then that gives us a third model, which actually is the correct model. And so this is how L sharp works. 
OK, so now. Um, in a few minutes, uh, let me just briefly go through correctness and, uh, and, and our experiments. And so. Correctness of, of a learning algorithm wants to show in termination, right? Because if it terminates, then yeah, you have learned to write model. That's the only way in which it can terminate. But basically, the algorithm does terminate because you, you make progress, right? You, you either you add a new frontier state or you add a new basis state or you create a new a partners pair. You, you create more information about your frontier states. And um, so when we add a basis state, uh, then uh, suddenly uh, a couple of partners pairs which you previously had disappeared. So in the norm, we use basis state quadratically, but then we can prove that this norm increases. And that gives us termination. And it gives Im immediately that uh, uh, the sort of quadratic uh, bound. And so actually we proved that if you have a specific instance of L sharp where you sort of postpone doing an equivalence query as long as you can, then uh, we have uh, asymptotically the same number of output queries as the best existing learning algorithms and we have at most n minus one equivalence queries because every equivalence query will add a new state to the basis. Um, so in um, our implementation we managed to speed up um, the algorithm considerably by being a bit smart and also using adaptive distinguishing sequences. And so instead of just using a, a fixed separating sequence, we are a bit smarter and we have an adaptive distinguishing sequence, which is sort of a decision tree. And so we, here, for instance, we start with an A and then depending on the output that we observe, we may choose either to terminate our experiment or to continue with input A or continue with input B. And so what we can do is we can sort of compute out of the observation tree um, the adaptive distinguishing experiment, which on average will create the largest number of new apartness pairs. And, and so that is sort of a, a recursive um, computation, which we can perform pretty efficiently, but it leads us to, gives us very, a very effective way to increase this termination norm of, of our algorithm. OK, I, I don't have time to explain the details. If there are questions, I can, can go into it. Uh, but this leads to a slight adaptation of our algorithm where um, so we use adaptive distinguishing sequences to, uh, to identify the, the, the frontier states. OK, so we, we implemented this stuff. We have a prototype implementation written in Rust. It's available online if you want to have a look at it. Um, and uh, so we compared it to um, LearnLib implementations of TTT, uh, ADT. That is a, a sort of new version of the TTT algorithm, which is also adaptive, and the original Rives Shapir algorithm. Um, and then uh, if you do experiments, we, you, you also have to select a way to, to, to implement the equivalence oracle. And there we used one conformance testing algorithm, which we called hybrid ADS, which performed pretty well in, in our earlier, earlier learning experiments. And so then we looked at 46 benchmark models. And so these all correspond to real protocols that we were models of real protocols that we learned like SSH and TCP and, and TLS and cards of, uh, of, of models of banking cards and uh, we compared uh, performance. So here are our experimental results. Um, so what do you see here? Um, so on the X axis you have the 46 different models. And then on the Y axis um, you see on an exponential scale the total number of input symbols and resets that we and the different algorithms need to perform. And so what we observe is that uh, if we look at the else 
sharp algorithm with the adaptive distinguishing sequences. It it, uh, it, it, it is at the lower end for each benchmark, except I guess one. There is one case where the ADT algorithm is slightly, slightly better. Um, and we see that Rives Shapir needs uh, most uh, input symbols. And then uh, had the two Dortmund uh, algorithms, uh, TTT and, and ADT, are in between. So this is interesting. Uh, these are the input symbols that we need for learning. Now we can also look at the total number of input symbols that we need both for learning and for finding the counterexamples. Then the picture is um, a bit less clear. Um, first of all, we see a huge variance in, in, in the outcome. So we repeated every experiment 100 times, but then still you see huge differences. And this has to do with the fact that when you do testing, you may be lucky and find a counterexample quickly, quick, or, or yeah, you may need a lot of time to find them. So yeah, let me conclude and, and wrap up. Uh, so I think this idea of using a partners and, and really identify these frontier states by, by having the smart test suites, test cases works pretty well. It's sort of a new perspective. Um, what is the new, what, what some things which we, some ideas are not new in the sense that there are other papers which, which also explore it. So for instance, the idea of using an observation tree is standard practice in passive learning. And in active learning, a team from Sheffield uh, also had developed a learning tool which is based on this, this idea of taking the observation tree as the primary data structure. Uh, of course, the, the basis and frontier um, uh, that you can also recognize as the upper and lower part in the uh, uh, observation table from, from Englund's algorithm. Uh, using uh, adaptive distinguishing sequences was implemented in the ADT algorithm. So probably the new element mainly is this focus on a partners rather than equivalence. Uh, and, and so the asymptotic complexity is the same, but, but in practice uh, we are competitive and, and I think there's still a lot of room still for, for improving the L-sharp algorithm. We just have a product, first prototype implementation. So there's a lot of uh, future work uh, handling big observation trees. We're working on that, uh, implementing all these optimizations. I think interesting pieces of future work is that now it becomes more natural and, and, and pretty obvious how to, to integrate learning and testing. Um, it's in a sense very inefficient that you have done this, this learning and you gain a lot of information and then you throw away all this information and you just give um, the hypothesis to the, to the testing tool. Now that you, you, why not give the whole the, the testing tool access to the full observation tree? Um, and then another thing which, which now becomes more natural is to integrate active and passive learning. Um, uh, because passive learning algorithms are based on, on state merging in the observation tree. And then, of, of course, one thing we want to do is to extend this idea to, to other and richer frameworks, such as register automata, symbolic automata, and, and weighted automata. And so actually, uh, we discovered L-sharp because we were working on a learning algorithm for symbolic automata, and then we thought, ah, this is an, an interesting idea, let's apply it to media machines first. OK, so uh, this is it. Um, paper is uh, accessible um, via archive, uh, and it will appear in Proceedings of TACAS. And general intro for model learning I, I presented a few years ago in, in a survey paper in communication of ACM. So I'm happy to take uh, any question. Thank you very much, Fritz. Uh, we are running a bit out of time, but if uh, Fritz has time, I suggest we take a few questions and we stay for about maybe 10 more minutes on the call, if that's okay. Fritz, is that okay yeah, with you? Yeah, that's fine with me, yeah. And uh, apologies to anyone who wants to leave. Uh, it will be recorded, and, and if Fritz and, and uh, other people agree, I will post also the question and answers to the uh, 
to you two. So uh, any questions to start with? Um, uh, Fritz, before the question starts, it's remarkable that coffee costs 10 cents in, in the Netherlands. It costs much more here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some people use euros in the... Uh, <laughs> yeah, and you maybe use pounds, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I could Actually, ask for, for students in our building, coffee is free. <laughs> um, we should all move to Namek. Uh, I, I, I could start with a question. So uh, it was... One, one remarkable um, observation that I saw in, in your diagram, in your uh, performance comparison, is that TTT and ADT, if you compare them, uh, in many cases, actually, TTT, which was the older algorithm, outperforms ADT, while in your case, uh, changing to adaptive distinguishing sequences seems to improve your performance. Do you have any explanation for that? Um... Yeah, that's a, that's a good that's a good question. I um, yeah, so I it it's very clear why going adaptive gives us such a performance jump, but I think in in our setting um, it is very natural to compute an adaptive distinguishing sequence from the observation tree, whereas in TTT what they do is they compute it from an hypothesis model using the Leonakakis algorithm. So that is sort of a different approach, which, which is more indirect. Mm -hmm. uh, but but so it's a very it's an interesting question you ask, and actually we are also what what uh, has the best way to uh, compute these adaptive distinguishing sequences also when observation trees get really big. Uh, because that is what we're interested in now with cases where the observation tree contains say 30 million states or so, uh, which is something you quickly arrive at. And we aren't afraid for such trees, but you need to take some special care in your algorithms. Are there any questions from the audience? Uh, I could keep on asking questions. Yes, uh, Matteo, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for it's very, very interesting. I hadn't seen the talk yet. Um, well, as you know, I'm very interested in, in the register business, register nominal business. And I was one, uh, Fritz is, oh, it's not moving, but it, it happens every once in a while. Okay, I don't uh, know whether he can hear me or not. Um, but we could hear him well, so I suggest you you, you do ask your question and then we'll see how, what happens. Okay, so my question actually uh, was, uh, so first, well, actually it's two parts. First, if you have any ideas on on the on how you can tackle the register uh, case, and then I was wondering if this has to do with somehow. Um, uh, using a richer data structure, uh, tree data structure that maybe has some kind of nominal flavor. Um, did you hear my question, Fritz? Uh, are you there, Fritz? You are a bit frozen. Did you hear us? Do you hear us now? Uh, yeah, I hear you now. Yeah. OK, did you hear the question from Matteo? No, I didn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So, Matteo, please. Sorry, uh, Matteo. No, that's fine. That's fine. I'll repeat it. No, I'm just interested in the, in the register uh, side of things. Uh, so, if you have any thoughts about it, and um, if you if you think this, uh, I mean, my my kind of feeling is that you might use, you know, your tree, tree data structure might somehow be enriched with 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 data or um, you know, um, maybe, uh, you know, tr treat it uh, nominally, you know, having some kind of symmetry on it and so on. So, yeah, I, just, I was just wondering what, are, what, what, what do you think about that? Um, yeah, so I am working on this with uh, Torsten uh, Wiesman. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so it's... Um, uh, there's no free lunch, of course, in, in general, and learning register automata is complicated. And uh, uh, so uh, you can follow a sort of similar algorithm, um, but then for the frontier states, 
you uh, do not only need to record to which states they, they correspond, but you also need to uh, explain what happens to the registers and right, how they right, are. Right. Right. Uh, so that is the sort of algorithm we are developing now. I but, see. But uh, yeah, it's I an see. obvious question to to sort of try to to see what happens when you uh, uh, sort of develop um, uh, algorithms uh, in, in, in using this new new perspective. And uh, so we've been talking to uh, uh, some people who, uh, with Geonique Briere uh, and, and, and others who have a paper in Takas also on learning uh, weighted automata, and, and they indicated, OK, look, if we would have known about L sharp before our Taka submission, we would have used, rephrased it in those terms. Hmm. Uh, so there it's at least one case where I think it it's it, it does help. Okay. Yeah. Th thank you, Fritz. Are there any other questions? Maybe I could ask one till another question arrives. So Fritz, in, in TTT, from what I recall, and that was long ago when I read it, uh, after you built that kind of distinguishing tree, I don't know how it's called in TTT, you also try to minimize it and try to bring the branches together and to, to put them as much as possible in the, on the same branch. Uh, I don't know whether you see my point uh, in kind yeah. of minimizing the tree. So that step, are you are you performing that step on your tree at all or? or? Um. No, so um, TTT is very forgetful uh, and it uh, sort of condenses all the, the information and you can, they, they sell it as an advantage. Um, uh, the advantage being that it's uh, very space efficient, which of course makes, makes uh, sense in certain applications. However, I think that in today's world, um, memory is not the problem. And, uh, so storing observation trees with millions of states is, is feasible. Um, but nevertheless, um, uh, maybe at some point we had uh, the observation tree gets too big for us. But then, of course, what we can always do is uh, decide to forget part of the tree. Right. And, and uh, uh, so in our case, um, uh, we have a choice to forget or not to forget. And TTT sort of has has memory loss built in. <laughs> and I see also a clear advantage once you are dealing with an evolving system, having more information helps you focus on the change more quickly. So not forgetting yeah. is helpful typically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions before we close the session? If there are no further questions, uh, thank you very much, Fritz. It was a wonderful talk. I, I learned a lot, and I think this is a really promising uh, approach. So we'll definitely be studying it in, in the coming uh, months. Thanks again. Okay, yeah. If you have interesting thoughts, let me know. It's uh, I'm interested. Thank okay, you. my pleasure. Okay.